welcome to Texas Heart Institute educational programs on innovative technologies and techniques. The purpose of these presentations is to inform and educate the general public as well as physicians and medical personnel on the latest advances in cardiovascular medicine. I'm your host, my name is Vladimir Krejci. I'm an interventional cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and Baylor CHI Medical Center. Our guest today is Dr. Anne Abbott. She's a neurologist and she's an associate professor at Central Clinical School in Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Welcome to Texas Art History, Dr. Abbott. Thank you, Dr. Crazy. So the topic uh, today of our discussion and conversation is treatment of carotid stenosis and differences between men and women. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, I would like to ask you, Dr. Abbott, can you explain to the participants of this program what is the fact cats? Because you are, mm. if not the founder, one of the mm -hmm. essential uh, individuals that made this happen. For those that do not know, uh, this organization is very successful and flourishing and expanding and uh, it has a very meaningful purpose. So can you talk a little bit about it? Well, thank you very much uh, for, for bringing this topic up. Um, FactCat stands for Faculty Advocating Collaborative and Thoughtful Carotid Artery Treatments. And this group started with, well, two people really, it was myself and Frank Feith, who's a vascular surgeon from New York. And we got together in 2011 and we were quite concerned about pressure to widen uh, reimbursement indications for carotid artery stenting to people at average surgical risk, so symptomatic and asymptomatic people. Um, we were concerned because we felt that the randomised trials had been misinterpreted because we felt the evidence showed that stenting is actually more dangerous than surgery and uh, guidelines were coming out advocating for more carotid stenting, which we didn't agree with. So we started a campaign and we rallied uh, 41 opinion leaders from around the world and we wrote, um, we published an evidence review and uh, advice to US Medicare for them not to expand stenting reimbursement indications. They didn't. Um, they didn't because they saw the evidence that Really, there's no current indication for any carotid procedure because of changes in advancements in medical treatment. That's simply lifestyle factors and medication. And also they saw that stenting was more dangerous. So um, from there, we also published another evidence review 12 months later and endorsed their decision. We had 51 uh, opinion leaders at that stage who'd come together and these people formed the first fact cats and from there we've always communicated by a joint email so we can share publications, we can debate fact versus fiction and we can also talk about our own cases if we're having trouble with a particular case. Um, someone can just, re um, just put that on, their, on our emails and it's all de-identified but immediately you might get half a dozen responses from anywhere around the world, surgeons, medical specialists, helping you with your treatment decisions. So we've grown to over 300 members now and we have several purposes really. And it's to improve academic standards, uh, education, and also we're still an action group. So if the need happened again, we could, um, we could rally and lobby for certain things to happen. So uh, I understand your point of view and the purpose of fact that that um, you want to uh, bring the truth to life as far as publications are concerned and uh, also um, analyze critically uh, randomized and non-randomized clinical trials and maybe um, bring this information to the public awareness. But one thing what struck me in your comments is that there is no indication for any carotid procedures that so that means that we interventional cardiologists and surgeons are doing a malpractice to patients how can uh, you say that with the techniques that have been actually uh, 
in practice for decades with a very rewarding results to a lot of our patients. Well, maybe there are technical results which are good in certain places, other places they're not getting such good results actually, but there's no current proven indication because all the carotid procedures are done based on randomized trials of surgery, endarterectomy versus just medical treatment. Uh, they were done up to, patients recruited now up to 37 years ago. So the studies were done roughly 20 to nearly 40 years ago. They're all out of date. So there's no current evidence of benefit. So even though we're doing a lot of procedures in many countries around the world, there's no evidence that we're actually benefiting these people. In fact, there's quite a lot of evidence that we've been harming them. So uh, let me ask you a specific question. So you basically say that there is not a single patient that would benefit from either carotid enterectomy or stenting in any kind of scenario. Not proven. Okay, in any kind of scenario. So let me again mention a patient that has a 90% symptomatic carotid stenosis and needs a major cardiac surgery. You would submit that patient to surgery without considering doing anything for the carotid stenosis? Well, certainly they should be on medical treatment because all the medical treatments are addressing risk factors like blood pressure, smoking, cholesterol, alcohol, diet, uh, exercise. But you cannot all of those smoke. Things. You cannot smoke during the procedure. That's good. So <laughs> that's, that's good. But what I'm trying to say, there is clear-cut evidence that open heart surgery, one of the major risk factors of having complications, is critical carotid stenosis. Are you talking about symptomatic people with right, carotid stenosis? Right, right, symptomatic. So what would you do with a patient that has a 95% carotid stenosis and has, has to undergo well, heart surgery? Whether they have to undergo heart surgery or not, I still advise people that have, who are symptomatic and have an ipsilateral carotid stenosis of at least 50 to 70%, depending whether they're male or female, depending on the timing of when that last event was. But for certain people who are symptomatic, I would still recommend endarterectomy, not stenting, endarterectomy with medical treatment. Okay. But I have to explain to them still that the evidence for benefit over just the medical treatment is, is very old. Right, so, so now you And those trials you, you should do be done again. So you, you do accept that there are certain scenarios where... It's not currently, there's no, it's, it's out of date evidence, but still it's the only evidence we have in that situation. It's not current. Okay. But for asymptomatic people, it's a bit different because we have measured their stroke rate with just medical treatment over time. We haven't done that with the symptomatic people. So we now have evidence that actually for the asymptomatic people, that they do better with just medical treatment. So do you think, of course, you are, you are a neurologist, you are non-invasive, and you uh, treat medically patients. Do you think that uh, the great majority of vascular surgeons would accept your point of view that the great majority of patients with critical carotid stenosis? Who are symptomatic? Symptomatic that have to undergo surgery of some kind mm -hmm. do not need an intervention on that carotid. Well, firstly, I, I didn't say that. So whether they need a surgery on their heart or somewhere else or not, if you just look at the carotid, if it's on the same side of the symptoms of the stroke and the TA, the same side of the brain affected, I would still recommend endarterectomy okay. with medical treatment. Okay. Telling the patient that data was, com you know, com was collected years ago, decades ago. Okay. And, but yeah, I would still okay. recommend that. And then, then if they've got an indication for heart surgery, like if they've got unstable angina, right. you really have to weigh up one thing against the other. What is more urgent? Like if the stroke or the TIA occurred months ago, if it was a um, female patient, mm -hmm. if it was less than 70% stenosis, those people in general are less likely to benefit even from endarterectomy. Okay. So you weigh that up against the risk of their heart. So sometimes you would go ahead still and do the heart procedure if that is indicated and not worry about the carotid. It depends on the, the d situation, the details. Well, <clears throat> I understand your point of view. And let me try to be simplistic because some of the audience might be uh, lay people that do not understand. Mm. 
the concepts and the details and randomized trials and so on. But the point is that um, if you go to a barber, you get a haircut. Mm -hmm. If you go to a surgeon, you get an atherectomy. Yeah. If you go to an international cardiologist or radiologist, you get carotid artery stenting. If you go to a neurologist, you get cholesterol-lowering medications, to simplify it in a way. So it means, are we, uh, are we trying to promote what we know, what we can do, or is it just uh, fair to say that there is such a preponderance of evidence available that medical treatment is the only treatment that's reasonable, everything else is not reasonable? I think medical treatment is still the only treatment that there's current evidence that it benefits the patient and it's worthwhile. It's still worthwhile treating blood pressure, cholesterol, um, helping them stop smoking and not drinking too much alcohol and having a good diet and exercise. There's still evidence for that, but unfortunately there's no current evidence for the benefit from a carotid procedure. That's just okay. the way it is. Can you uh, tell me for the last few decades, what are the latest advances and uh, the most appropriate treatment as far as medications are concerned and change in lifestyle for patients with cerebrovascular disease? Well, over the last uh, three decades to four decades, um, we can look at people with asymptomatic advanced carotid stenosis. So these are people with at least 60% or 50% narrowing of their carotid with no previous symptoms of stroke or TIA involving the same side of the brain. And um, we've measured, as I mentioned, their stroke rates have been measured reliably over time since the first reliable estimates were made in the mid-1980s and since the ACAS trial was done, for instance. And uh, overall, there's been at least uh, a 65% fall in the um, average annual rate of same-sided stroke. So the most recent measurements from reliable studies approximate a, ro a rate of about 0.8% per year, it's less than 1%. But what, what I wanted to ask you actually Look at the three decades in the back, medical treatment three decades ago, mm. and medical treatment now. This is what I wanted you to mention because yeah. some of the participants in this. What um, is it? What does like it consist to, of? Right, so. Right, well, that's um, a that's very interesting question. Uh, like in those studies over time, the nature of the medical treatment given to the patients was usually very poorly, if, if at all, described. Right. Uh, that's because for all these years we've taken for granted the importance of medical treatment it is and the effect it has on stroke rates and therefore the importance to document it. But overall what they were given reflected what was usual at the time in practice with respect to diagnosing and treating those risk factors I mentioned before. And over time we know that the definition of those risk factors, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, they've all changed, they've all become more sensitive. So we're treating people earlier with drugs and also the drugs to treat those risk factors have improved a lot. So of course the statins were introduced, right. but they've only had an impact relatively recently. So they only became more widely uh, used, people, especially in people with carotid artery disease from about 2000. By then the fall had already started. So it's not just statins. Mm -hmm. Also, blood pressure tablets are, are better, well tolerated as well, and generally more effective. And people have um, generally uh, stopped smoking as well. They've tended to stop smoking, so the public health campaigns are working. Over that time, that graph, there's been at least a 15% fall in the number of baseline smokers in those studies. They're also getting older at baseline across those studies and that mm -hmm. meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. So that means these people are living longer stroke-free lives, longer, healthier lives with just medical treatment. Oh, that's very important. It is very obviously. important, yes. Mm -hmm. And those are great achievements as far as the medical treatment is concerned. There is no mm. doubt about it. More public awareness, um, better recognition of problems, risk factors, and better medical treatment options, particularly now with uh, advances in cholesterol-lowering medications, which PCSK9 inhibitors, which can dramatically reduce the cholesterol levels uh, and hopefully even reverse to a certain degree uh, not only mm. carotid disease but uh, 
cardiac everywhere. and another everywhere. Yeah. So, um, uh, Dr. Abbott, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the information available on asymptomatic carotid uh, stenosis patients? Oh, okay. Well, um, well, using that information that we know about medical treatment and how stroke rates have fallen over, over the decades for asymptomatic carotid stenosis, uh, we can now estimate that only about 4% at the most of people with asymptomatic carotid stenosis of at least 50 to 60% could possibly benefit from a carotid procedure during their lifetime. Now that's not many and it's the best case scenario. So I'll just go through the um, reasoning behind that. Mm -hmm. So from that meta-analysis, we saw that the average annual ipsilateral stroke rate in the most recent studies was only about 0.8%. And the average age of diagnosing the lesion, uh, advanced asymptomatic carotid stenosis, was about was 70 years in those studies. And the average survival of those people was 10 years. And about half the strokes occurring in the distribution of the lesion are not actually due to the, the lesion. So there are other causes of stroke in these people like atrial fibrillation and intracranial disease. So uh, that 4% uh, figure also assumes that um, that the 30-day procedural stroke or death rate is always and always is always and everywhere going to be zero. So based on those simple calculations, you can work out that only about four percent of the most of people could benefit, and you can't always have a procedural stroke or death rate of zero. So overall, to me, this means that we have passed the era where a carotid procedure is likely to provide overall benefit for people with asymptomatic coronal stenosis. Very interesting. So uh, what do you think about recent guidelines from Europe that recommend that carotid mm. endoterectomy for asymptomatic carotid artery stenosis, if certain stroke risk markers are present, such as transcranial Doppler microemboli, plaque progression over a period of time, bulky and homogeneous equilucent plaque, what, what, what is your opinion on it? Um, I don't think these are good markers to identify people who should have surgery or, or even stenting if they're asymptomatic with carotid stenosis because um, most of those markers that are mentioned in those guidelines have not even been shown to identify people at higher um, risk of ipsilateral stroke than those people without the marker. And um, where they have been shown to be identify those at higher risk of same-sided stroke, the annualised stroke rates in the presence of those markers are still quite low, are too low to justify um, surgery or stenting for that matter. And none of the markers have been tested using current optimal medical treatment. So that means all those rates are artificially high compared to what we can do now. The trial, their risk stratification studies are out of date. And um, also, we haven't done randomised trials to show that those markers identify people who do overall benefit from the carotid procedures. And also, um, you'll find that just about all asymptomatic people with carotid stenosis will have at least one of those markers. So it's another way of encouraging us to operate or stand all, of, all the people with asymptomatic carotid stenosis. And of course, we know that's inappropriate. So for many reasons, I. I would say that these markers should not be used to justify the routine use of carotid artery surgery or stenting for these people. One of the burning issues that we have to discuss, and a uh, very important one, is uh, differences between men and women in respect to uh, presentation of symptoms and indications, if any, for carotid endoterectomy or carotid artery stenting. So. Uh, uh, we have a certain information available from the literature, even though the information is limited as far as women are concerned, because they are not represented to the same degree in the clinical trials as men have mm -hmm. been. That's right. And so on. And uh, there is uh, also evidence that uh, there, women are more likely to be harmed with surgery or stenting for that particular reason. Yeah. So, uh, so you do agree that the future studies are needed to look at this particular issue more in detail. So I want you to uh, maybe uh, 
mention briefly your personal opinion on it, because I'm sure you analyzed this in the past as well. Uh, what is your understanding as far as women versus men and incidence of cerebral vascular disease and complications related to it? Well, men and women are different. That's the first point to make. And quite often they're treated as the same in trials and, and in guidelines, but this is wrong because uh, women uh, tend to present later in life with carotid artery disease than men. And in general, they present later in life with arterial disease. So you have to adjust for that difference in age at presentation. And also women with carotid artery disease, if they're just on medical treatment, they tend to, uh, their risk of stroke falls off quicker than men. And women tend to have less aggressive disease too if it's surgery, the surgical specimens show that their plaques are usually smaller and less aggressive. So there are differences. And then of course there are differences with respect to treatment effects, surgery and stenting. Very good. Well, that is true for um, all kind of uh, conditions uh, related to uh, women. I know in particular, uh, as far as abdominal aortic aneurysm is concerned, typically the women have, will have more challenging anatomy as far as axis vessels or infrarenal neck, uh, smaller vessels, more diffuse disease, and uh, the outcomes have not been in the past as good as, as for men and many other conditions as well. So we certainly mm. need more information to uh, be able to better treat women with this type of a condition. Let's, uh, let's talk about women and uh, clinical trials, and I want you to elucidate a little bit more what is, what is available, particularly related to carotid enterotorectomy trials for symptomatic and asymptomatic patients, okay. concentrating on women. All right, well, we're going to go through the symptomatic women first. So these are women, or men for that matter, symptomatic patients. They've had, uh, they've had a stroke or a TAA involving the same side of the brain as the carotid artery disease, the narrowing is situated. So when it comes to trials of endarterectomy versus just medical treatment, randomized trials, symptomatic patients, the only women to actually receive an overall statistically significant benefit from endarterectomy compared to just medical treatment were those with 70 to 99% stenosis using the NASET measurement method. And they had to have endarterectomy within two to three weeks from their last same-sided stroke or TIA. But they also had to satisfy other criteria. They had to have a life expectancy of at least three to five years. And they had to satisfy all the trial inclusion and exclusion criteria. And they also had to have no distal lumen collapse beyond the degree of narrowing. Mm -hmm. um, and also the 30 day stroke or death rate from the procedure had to be less than about 6% hmm. to benefit. So that's only one very select group of symptomatic women. Right. So um, for instance, no other subgroups of women benefited including the people in the trials, the women in the trials with, um, with high-grade stenosis, 70 to 99% NACET measurement stenosis, who had endarterectomy after two to three weeks from the last same-sided stroke or TIA. They didn't benefit. And also women with moderate stenosis, 50 to 69% narrowing, no matter what the timing was for their last same-sided ischemic event, TIA or stroke. So the symptomatic men in those trials, um, they, had, they overall were more likely to benefit. Mm -hmm. We're basically talking about pooled data from NASET and ECST for the women, mm -hmm. but for the men there was an additional study, the Veterans Affairs study. So overall for men in those trials using pooled data, they still received a statistically significant benefit from surgery compared to just medical treatment if they had moderate stenosis, so 50 to 69%, again using NASA criteria, and as long as they had their endarterectomy within two to three weeks from the last same-sided stroke or TIA. And interestingly, the symptomatic men with very high-grade stenosis, so 70 to 99%, again using NASA criteria, uh, 
Um, they also had a benefit from endarterectomy, performed up to about three months after their last same-sided stroke or TIA. So they're much more likely to benefit than women. And these men in particular, that, that second group, most of the benefit occurred in the first two to three weeks after their last same-sided mm -hmm. stroke or TIA and fell rapidly over time. But nevertheless, after three months, they still had a benefit. Mm. They also had to satisfy all the study inclusion, exclusion criteria, right. no distal lumen collapse, and mm. the 30-day the stroke or death rate from the surgery had to be less than about 6%. 6%. Yeah. So, so was there a benefit for asymptomatic women from the carotid enterectomy trials? Um, no. Overall, there was no clearly statistically significant benefit for women. So, Can you mention some of yeah. those trials? <laughs> <laughs> so the ACAS trial has really been the only randomized trial of surgery versus medical treatment alone for people with asymptomatic carotid stenosis. So just to get that out, out there in the front, so out there first. Mm -hmm. um, so the, another trial is mentioned, the ACST trial is mentioned sometimes, but that wasn't a trial of surgery versus just medical treatment because that was a study of delayed versus immediate surgery in darterectomy. And by the time the trial finished, about 20% of their patients in the deferred arm, delayed surgery arm, had had surgery. And they also included people with remote who were remotely symptomatic. So you'd had stroke or TIA in relation to the same carotid artery they were studying um, more than about three months ago. So that the trials weren't the same. So ACAS is still the dominant trial um, in terms of justifying endarterectomy for asymptomatic carotid stenosis. So uh, women did not receive a statistically significant benefit from endarterectomy in ACAS. And then if you want to consider ACST, um, the women in that study that came closest to benefiting from endarterectomy, they were aged less than 75, so the younger ones. Mm -hmm. And that was only a borderline statistically significant result. I see. Men were more likely to benefit in the trials if they were asymptomatic with carotid stenosis. Mm -hmm. But still not many men benefited. They had to be less than 75 to 80 years of age and they had to have um, at least 60% um, asymptomatic carotid stenosis using the NASIC criteria for measurement. They had to have a life expectancy of at least three to five years. And again, they had to satisfy all the trial inclusion and exclusion criteria. And the, um, the surgical stroke or death rate had to be less than about we could debate this, but it could have to be certainly less than 1.7 to 3%. So the 1.7% comes from ACAS without the angiographic risk, and we probably should have been using that standard all along because we mm. don't do right. angiography anymore. And the 3% figure comes from the ACST trial. Um, and you could also argue for a 2.3% risk because that was the risk in ACAS um, with angiography. What is the risk of carotid endarterectomy for women compared to men? Um, well, overall, overall, in all the trials, randomized trials of surgery versus medical treatment, doesn't matter whether you're symptomatic people or asymptomatic people with stenosis, women did worse. Worse, right. Yeah, they had a higher procedural risk of stroke or death compared to men. And that is repeated basically in all of the trials, so this is pretty convincing information. Yeah, because there have been other studies that are not randomised, just observational right. studies, and uh, there's been a meta-analysis, for, for example, by Bond mm -hmm. et al, published in 2005, and it was consistent with what was seen in the randomised trials, that women still had a higher rate of stroke or death than men with endarterectomy. What about now carotid artery stenting? Yes. Oh. Can you mention a little bit about that? <laughs> yes. That is for you is definitely controversial. So can you uh, right. mention a few of them that uh, have uh, been completed and uh, mm. at least gave us some information whether there are any benefits or not? There have been lots of randomized trials, stenting versus endarterectomy, uh, mostly for symptomatic people with carotid stenosis. But in all of those trials, pretty much and certainly overall, stenting has been shown to be worse than endarterectomy. 
It causes about twice as many 30-day um, periprocedural strokes or deaths than endarterectomy and that risk of stroke or death is not compensated by the risk of heart attack associated with endarterectomy. So that's a sort of a common furphy, that furphy term that I like to use, a misunderstanding or a mistruth. It's certainly not true that um, the risk of heart attack with endarterectomy compensates for the risk of stroke with stenting because if you look at all those randomised trials of surgery versus stenting, um, periprocedural stroke was about four and a half times more common than periprocedural heart attack and most of those strokes occurred with stenting. And overall in those trials, the 30-day rate of stroke, heart attack and death was about 1.6 times higher with stenting. So it's quite conclusive from the randomised trials and also from registry data that stenting is much more harmful to patients than endarterectomy. So, uh, you know, some of the critics of this particular assessment of your or interpretation of this would say, well, a lot of those trials were poorly designed, poorly done, and they were actually aborted because of a suboptimal performance of the operators or poor design of the trial. Mm -hmm. And I can mention a few of them, such as space trial, mm -hmm. that had terrible outcomes because uh, the operators were doing procedures they should not be doing the procedures. EVA 3S, similar, so cavitus is totally outdated. There was actually a carotid artery angioplasty performed in certain scenarios in this particular trial. So we cannot lump all of those trials together and say on, in general that all of them are bad as far as carotid artery stenting is concerned because some of them were just not well and properly designed. Nevertheless, we haven't shown that stenting benefits any patient with carotid artery disease. Right, on we the basis of this information. That's all the information we have. Suboptimal trials. That's so. all we have. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's still no, there's no establishment of a routine practice role for carotid stenting. So for instance, another criticism might be, Crestar trial was pretty reasonably carried on in experienced centers by experienced operators, even though there were little trends and differences as far as complications and morbidity is concerned and mortality between carotid artery stenting versus endarterectomy, this was not statistically significant, and yet you claim that there was a significant difference, but the p-values were not significant. In the CREST trial, um, it was certainly statistically significant that stenting caused more 30-day strokes or deaths than endarterectomy for symptomatic people. And then when it comes to the asymptomatic people or the people with asymptomatic carotid stenosis, um, no statistically significant difference, but the study was underpowered. The confidence intervals overlap one, but the trend was still towards nearly the twice the as trend. many. Yeah. So there is a trend, but mm. no statistically significant difference. But if you so had have had a larger sample size, it's highly yeah. likely that you would have shown that Stenting causes tw uh, nearly twice as many strokes or deaths in 30 days of the procedure compared to endarterectomy. If, but there wasn't. So that information is not there. It, it's just a speculation that it would happen, right? Mm, well, that's why you need larger sample size before you can establish a routine practice role for this exactly. procedure. So you could say that it's inconclusive with you potential. Could, you could say. But I've understood that recently Ross Naylor um, published a meta-analysis. There is evidence now that with larger samples all pulled together, just asymptomatic people, that they're showing that stenting is more dangerous than endarterectomy, statistically significantly. Any other studies that you would like to mention related to this particular issue? Mm, well, I haven't mentioned that uh, stenting, of course, has not been compared to current optimal medical treatment. So that's right. the other thing. Right. So there's no, there's no uh, basis for saying that stenting should be done as a routine practice treatment for anyone with carotid artery disease. A lot of people are at particularly high risk of stenting too. Like if you've just recently had your 
ipsilateral stroke or TIA, you're many times higher at higher risk of having a procedural stroke than compared to endarterectomy. And women are particularly susceptible and there are quite a few other thing, uh, markers that put you at higher risk from stenting. So there are some uh, newer trials that are ongoing at the present time. Mm -hmm. And one of them is CREST-2 yeah. that uh, wanted to address this particular issue of advances in medical treatment mm -hmm. of carotid artery disease and comparing medical treatment to surgery and medical treatment to carotid artery stenting. Can you mention briefly your opinion on whether CREST-2 is going to give us some of the answers and uh, what are the positive things about CREST and what are the negative things about CREST in your personal opinion? Well, I think the, the biggest positive thing about CREST too is that after a long time of just having randomized trials of stenting versus endarterectomy, they're finally having medical treatment considered as a standalone effective treatment. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an arm on its own in this trial, whereas the other, right. We've not been doing that in previous trials. Um, anyway, so it's actually a study of two randomized trials running in parallel. Mm -hmm. So they're comparing endarterectomy versus um, medical treatment on its own. Both procedural arms have medical treatment as well. And then the other trial is stenting with medical treatment versus medical treatment alone. Um, unfortunately, I think though the overall, the trial is both randomised trials are going to be underpowered because what they're doing is they're taking average surgical risk people with asymptomatic carotid stenosis of at least 70% and they're randomising them to medical treatment versus a procedure. Um, but we already know, <coughs> we already know from what we've just discussed and the studies have been done since ACAS that these people are unlikely to benefit from a carotid procedure overall mentioned that 4% figure at the moment, at most 4% are likely to benefit from a carotid procedure during their lifetime, as long as the procedural stroke or death rate is always zero, which is not possible. So in other words, I, I feel that we've passed the era where a carotid procedure is likely to provide overall benefit mm -hmm. for a generally fit person, or any person for that matter, with um, advanced asymptomatic carotid stenosis. Right. Well, thank you very much for um, visiting our institution, Texas Heart Institute. It's a special pleasure to have you as a guest at our institution. And we greatly appreciate your expertise and knowledge and information provided to us related to uh, carotid artery disease, carotid intervention, medical therapy, what works and what doesn't work. Thank you very well, much. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>